Uh, my name is Peter Spragata. I am a distinguished engineer with Red Hat and most and, and very specifically within the Ansible product family. So um, I actually handle driving both our tactical and strategic direction for what we do in networking as it relates to Ansible. Um, but just a real quick side note uh, about myself, although I, I do everything from an Ansible perspective uh, with regards to networking, I also have a background in networking, over 25 years in networking. So I'm always happy to, to chat, you know, just straight network engineering, network operations. This is, you know, network field day. Um, you know, but we'll definitely get into to automation and networking and, and, you know, let's just have some fun today. So to get started, um, you know, let's kind of talk about what, how the day is going to unfold here, or the next couple of hours are going to unfold. I really kind of tried to break this down into three primary sections. We have a couple of subsections as we kind of get into it. But I wanted to take a moment, and, and we'll spend a little bit of time just talking about who Red Hat is for, for you know, just a few slides. We won't spend a lot of time here. But, you know, and, and one of the things that I hope you get as we talk, as we walk away from this is that, you know, Red Hat is a networking company. You know, a lot of people when they hear the word Red Hat, you know, immediately they think Linux, 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 and that is true. But Red Hat is also in a lot of different areas, and we'll talk a little bit about that, and, and specifically, you know, on the network side, what we're doing. Obviously, everyone is here and tuning in to hear about Ansible, and, and very specifically, what we're doing in the network space um, around Ansible networking. So we'll get into that. We'll go really deep with that. We'll talk a lot about, you know, what what Ansible looks like. We'll, we'll dive into Ansible in some depth. We'll talk about uh, Ansible networking, and then we'll really get into you know, where we're starting to take things, you know, what we're seeing, what we're hearing back from our strategic customers, what we're hearing back from our community, and you know, really where we see things going in, in the direction that, that we're taking them in. And then we'll wind down the day and we'll just talk about embracing automation. And, and while this definitely will have an Ansible spin to it, it really is more of a, a commentary on you know, what does it really mean to embrace automation, and, and we'll talk some about that. So uh, as we go through this, looking forward to, you know, questions and, and interjections and, um, you know, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go down some rat holes and that's okay. We'll, we'll climb our way back out of them. So let's get into it. So we're going to start with this first section with an introduction to Red Hat. And I wanted to take this moment because a lot of people don't know much about Red Hat. A lot of people have heard the name, a lot of people can associate the logo, but a lot of people don't really know the breadth of what Red Hat is really all about. Red Hat is actually organized into really what we call three pillars. And these really drive everything that we do at Red Hat. And it's all designed around this transition to the open hybrid cloud. It's this idea, right, that we're starting to move to a place where we can bring cloud technology, cloud native applications, and really build open systems to really deliver that. And, and Red Hat is playing a very key part in doing this. So we've got Within our, our three pillars, um, one, of the, one of the mainstays of it is, is our management and automation pillar. And, and this is where we're going to spend most of our time today. This is where the Ansible uh, BU falls into the, the greater Red Hat family. But I think you know, the, the interesting part here is that recognizing, or Red Hat has recognized, that in order for organizations to embrace open hybrid clouds and multi-cloud strategies, that management and automation has to play a very key component thereof. It can't be a it can't be an afterthought. It can't be a bolt on. It can't be something that comes later. Because that's the only way that we're ever going to be able to operate some of these hyperscale infrastructures is by making management and automation first class uh, within, the, uh, within the portfolio. So diving into this a little bit different or a little bit deeper, we're looking just at the Red Hat management pillar here. And you know, across the entire Red Hat line, everything permeates from Red Hat Enterprise Linux, whether we're talking about it running on, on bare metal, whether we're talking about it running in a container, whether we're talking about it running in a VM, running in the cloud. The, the reality is everything permeates from there. However, what we recognize is that, as I said, management has to be an integral part of the strategy. And going in even deeper than that, within Red Hat management, we recognize that automation plays a very significant role in this entire process. You know, we're very quickly getting to a day whereby you can't just simply orchestrate applications without taking into the considerations of the network, right? For far too long, organizations have operated in very heavy siloed environments, right? You had app devs and you had the systems team and the storage team and the network team and the cloud team and all these different teams. And by and large, it's still true in a lot of cases, but we're starting to see some of that shift. And part of what's helping that is the fact that we start to build these management platforms integrated directly in the portfolio. 
thinking about Ansible specifically, we actually call out networking for a very specific reason. And that is that there are key things, key considerations that need to be made when we start thinking about automating the network and how we're going to go about doing that and making sure that we can do that you know, at scale and do that in a way that really uh, encompasses everything um, necessary to ultimately service that full stack developer. And that's um, you know, one of the key components of, of the overall uh, Red Hat management portfolio. Here's another real interesting eye-opening fact. A lot of people don't realize how big Red Hat truly is. We are, um, obviously we've made our living in open source, um, but we're also a $2 billion a year company. And, and so you know, the reason I want to point this out is that you know, as we go through this and we talk about the open source side of things, we'll also talk a little bit about how does that translate into Red Hat product and specifically how does, what does that mean from an Ansible and an Ansible network standpoint and what that means for our customers. Um, but you're getting an organization that has established itself and has the backing, the financial backing, to know that it isn't going anywhere anytime soon. And that's really key, especially when we start talking about building network automation platforms. So where do you find Red Hat? You find them all over the place. Um, you know, Red Hat has a absolutely tremendous number of community projects. Everything we do in Red Hat is tied to an open source project. A lot of what we like to say is that Red Hat is really an enterprise software development company or a software company that leverages an open source development model. So we bring all of the benefits of enterprise class software, but we just simply leverage open communities to ultimately build it and, and distribute it. So with that being said, Let's start into really getting into Ansible because in reality, that's why we're here. <coughs> Excuse me. Let me back up a step for just a second. So uh, we're starting our next section now. So my name is Peter Spergata and uh, we're gonna get into talking about Ansible now in, in some depth. So the, the progression here is we'll, we'll get into Ansible here. And we'll talk about what Ansible is from a functional standpoint, from an implementation standpoint, and then we'll start to touch on what Ansible is doing from the network side. Um, it's important, though, to understand what Ansible is and how it's architected and how it's built to understand why we were able to adapt it to networking. So to get started, right, Ansible, we look at Ansible really as the next generation, if you will, of automation platforms. So for you know, folks like myself who are old and have been around for a very long time and can, can trace roots all the way back to roughly 92, we first saw a tool on the market called CF Engine. And CF Engine was a machine depend, dependent based application. It was written in C. Um, and it was based on, excuse me, promise theory. The whole point of CF Engine was how can I automate systems tasks so that I don't have to spend majority of my day performing activities that really could be left better to software to do. So, you know, CF Engine kind of plotted along and, and, you know, they did some really great things, but, you know, eventually the problem with CF Engine is it had to be custom compiled for every platform it ultimately had to be run on. So, along comes a, a, a company called Puppet and they said, you know what, we're going to take CF Engine, but we're going to develop it in such a way that we remove the machine dependent specifics. And, and essentially CF Engine, by and large, was roughly rewritten and today we now know it as Puppet. Now it's obviously evolved quite a bit since then, but that was really where Puppet really kind of started to come from. And it actually inherited a lot of the same concepts from CF Engine. And then of course we saw the split uh, you know, from Puppet and ultimately that is what created Chef. And, and so now we've got really you know, two, by and large, automation platforms, Chef and Puppet out there. Um, in both of those cases though, those particular platforms were based on an agent um, running on the target device. So while that was fine when you're dealing with how do I automate servers, um, it became a real problem when it wanted to automate things that didn't have a runtime environment that could load arbitrary code for, uh, for execution. So along comes a gentleman by the name of Michael DeHaan, and if you don't recognize that name, he is the, actually the original founder of the Ansible project. Um, ironically, given that this is, is uh, Network Field Day, he actually started working on Ansible when he was employed at Cisco, believe it or not. He was actually employed at Cisco, and he was uh, working on, working with Cisco to figure out how to automate their OpenStack deployment, back when, when Cisco was doing their own OpenStack 
uh, distribution. And he was using Puppet at the time. And, and, and out of frustration for trying to get OpenStack automated, just from a, an installation standpoint, it really started to the, the formation of what today we now know as Ansible. So fast forward, um, he goes off, he builds Ansible, and here we are roughly five or six years later um, you know, talking about, about Ansible. Now, for those of you who don't know, Ansible from a, a sizing perspective is one of the largest open source projects in the world. Um, now, there's interesting ways to measure that and talk about that, and, and we could always get into to very um, subjective discussions about what matrix makes sense and what metric doesn't make sense. And, and, um, but you know, I think by and large, the, the reality is, is that you know, the Ansible ecosystem grew substantially faster than just about any other project uh, in the same time period. So, but I digress. Let's get back to, to, to you know, really the foundation of Ansible. Um, I talked about the fact that, that Ansible is, we look at Ansible as kind of the second generation of automation platforms. And you know, one of the key tenets that, that we think about when we think about Ansible, why we think it's a, as a second generation automation platform is the fact that it was started by being agently based. In other words, let's get rid of the agent running on the, the end node. There's no need for it, right? It just creates complexity. It, and and you know, complexity is the killer from an operational perspective. So let's just get rid of it. Let's fall back to a very tried and true transport, SSH. And we get a tremendous amount of benefit from doing that. First and foremost, by using SSH as our, our underlying transport for how we talk to end devices, it's a very secure automation platform without even trying. We didn't have to do anything to make it secure. We simply leverage SSH and all the work that goes into making SSH secure. However, the fact that it was agentless did not preclude us from wanting to make sure that it could still perform very powerful automation capabilities. Right? We still had to be able to do everything we need to do from an automation standpoint, which means I need to be able to automate the life cycle of an application. I can't just simply push it out, fire, and forget it, if you will. So we spent a lot of time working into the Ansible language, the ability to do um, substantial amount, a substantial amount of automating both in and around the application domain, um, including reaching out to storage, cloud, networking, systems, etc. But I think the, the, the most significant tenet of Ansible, and it's probably the one that most, we most associate with, is this idea of simple. Michael DeHaan had this idea that automation should be easy to consume. It, that automation should not require somebody who's got a PhD in computer science to be able to put together what it takes to automate resources in IT. In addition to that, we wanted Ansible to not only be able to perform its automation capabilities, but also be able to self-describe what it was doing. In other words, what we mean by that is that an Ansible playbook, and this is parlance we use for how we build automation, we'll get into all that, but an Ansible playbook should read more like a document than a script. And that was really the idea um, early on within Ansible and continues to be the idea today. It's something, as part of the core engineering team, I can tell you, it's something we think and talk about an awful lot. We're always thinking about, is this simple? Is this easy to use? If it feels like we're trying to jam a square peg into a round hole, one of two things are happening. Either A, we're trying to ask Ansible to do something it was never designed to do, or B, maybe we need to take that feature back and rethink it. Because if it isn't simple, it really doesn't belong in Ansible. And that's something we, we really try and adhere to every day. So let's take a little bit deeper look into to Ansible. So Ansible is an automation engine, full stop, nothing else. That's the end, good day. There is nothing more to Ansible other than an automation engine. I don't want to be your inventory system. I don't want to be your, e your EMS. I don't want to be your OSS. I don't want to be your DNS. I don't want to be any of those things. I am automation. And that's all I do, and that's all we focus on. But what we realized is that you know, automation is an interesting discussion because automation, no one can sell you automation. I can't sell you automation. Right? In fact, so much so automation, when done correctly, is really a layered approach. Right? It's, it's taking a bunch of systems and making them work together ultimately to achieve a benefit or, or a business process. So what we realized when we thought about that is that Ansible has to be something that A, does its job and gets out of your way. 
And, and one of the ways that Ansible does that is there's, there's no runtime component to Ansible. And we'll talk a little bit more about that as we get into some of the demos and so forth. Um, but the other thing about Ansible is we want it to work with everything under the sun. So here's an interesting thing to ponder. So, so again, for, for the old people like me, everyone remembers in the 90s the router wars, right? We had Cisco and we had Wellfleet and we had IBM and we had Proteon and on and on and on and on we go. Hmm? DEC, absolutely. Absolutely. <laughs> Without question. <laughs> um, and, you know, I can remember in, in that particular space, um, you know, Wellfleet is a great example. Their router was Technically, it was significantly more superior than the Cisco product, much more so. It performed better, it was more stable, it was a fantastic product. But it had two major flaws. I'm just curious, did anyone in the room actually work with Wellfleet, ever work with Wellfleet routers? Do you remember the, do you remember the command interface? Uh, I mostly use the Demager. The, the, the site, site Mangler? Site Mangler. <laughs> site Mangler, like, absolutely. So, so the, the Wellfleet CLI, was based around SNMP. You did sets and gets of OIDs. That's exactly what you did. That's exactly what you did. That's right. All life doing get set. That's right. Mm. So, so the interface was god awful horrible, unless you had Site Mangler, and then it got even worse from that point forward. Um, but the other, the other shortcoming to Wellfleet is that it only worked with one protocol, IP. Now, they added SNA a little bit later, but everything in the Wellfleet world said, we got to collapse around IP. And what Cisco did, and I think very smart on their side, is A, they made iOS easily consumable. I mean, we can talk all day long about what iOS is and isn't anymore, but certainly back in the day, it was very user-friendly as far as the CLI goes. The second thing is it did is it worked with everything under the sun. It didn't matter what you had deployed in your infrastructure. If you had IP, if you had IPX, if you had Banyan Vines, if you had DECnet, if you had SNA, if you had Apollo. Anyone remember Apollo? <laughs> yeah. um, Cisco worked with it. And, and I think because of those two facts, that's why Cisco ultimately ended up really winning. I mean, yeah, we could talk about their marketing and all that business, but those were the fundamental things that, that drove people to ultimately leveraging Cisco in their environments. I took a lot of that history, and I thought about that you know, as Ansible really started to build out. And from an Ansible perspective, we have the same idea, is that we want to make it really easy to consume. Make it simple for people to use, right? And the second thing is it has to work with everything. And that's really what talks to this point about the layering of automation. I can't be your inventory system, but I can work with every other inventory out there. One of the, one of the things that Ansible has is it has the ability to reach into one or more systems and be able to extract inventory information and feed that into Ansible at runtime. So you don't have to create shadow copies, cached copies of what your inventory is. I mean, how many of us have had to install right, a, another network management tool or just an IT management tool, and there was the, and we got to spend you know, half a day porting inventory over so we've got our inventory so we can start doing things. You know, Ansible can extract information from, we've got a whole bunch of, of predefined scripts, and you can write your own. We actually expose the data structure. So if you've got a custom you know, back-end database where some of your inventory lives, we can reach into there, we can grab it. If you've got your inventory already set in, AWS or VMware or OpenStack or everyone's favorite inventory system, Microsoft Excel, right? <laughs> we can reach into it and, and we can extract that information and make use of it. Kind of along those same lines as Ansible had to work with everything underneath the sun. You know, we couldn't just be a Linux system tool. We couldn't just be a cloud tool. We had, to, we had to be able to do everything. We wanted to be able to touch everything. And by and large, we have. So whether you're looking at automating systems, or cloud, or your application development pipeline, or your network, or storage, or IoT, or wherever else you may look to be doing automation, Ansible provides a way to do it. And the way that we provide is that Ansible, while being an automation engine, is also a massively pluggable, extensible system. There's almost nothing that you can't somehow fundamentally change in the Ansible ecosystem. What you get out of the box is not what you're stuck with. And, and that was a big part of, of how Ansible gets built. We can modify everything from the module we use to talk to a device to how an Ansible playbook runs. And we'll talk a little bit about how playbooks run and, and why that, that's a big deal. So speaking of playbooks, playbooks are our most fundamental interface. 
We write playbooks. That's what we do. That's how we consume automation in the Ansible world. A playbook is three things. A playbook is the host that I want to go talk to, the node or host specific variable information I want to utilize, and the set of tasks that I want to perform. Now in the Ansible world, a set of tasks are executed on serially from top to bottom. It's my to-do list, my honey-do list, if you will. Right? One, two, three, four, no exception. Well, no yeah, exception by careful. default. Be careful. Yeah. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. There are, there are exceptions to that rule. But I think the, the, the salient point here is we don't try to guess what your intention is with the playbook. We execute it the way you gave it to us. We don't try and automatically try and rearrange how we're doing things and create some weirdly shaped you know, execution model that go off and then apply it to the end node. We take a list of tasks and we iterate through them. Now the way that we actually talk to end systems and actually perform activities is right here in this area called modules. We're going to talk a lot about modules today, but we're also going to talk about where we go from here because modules are, are an interesting beast. But modules are actually really what comprise the most fundamental working unit within Ansible. It's something that goes and does something. Create a user, create a VLAN, turn up that interface, um, you know, provision a new BGP neighbor. These are all modules within Ansible, and we have a, a whole slew of them. In fact, Ansible ships with, keep me honest here, Ansible ships with well over 1,500 of these things out of the box. So that means when you install Ansible, you've got 1,500 little things that you can go off and do. And we'll talk about how we start to use those, uh, especially in networking, to do some interesting things. But, and, and I also talk about this plugin idea. You know, you run an Ansible playbook, and we're going to actually run some Ansible playbooks a little bit later today. But you run an Ansible playbook, and you get some default output. But there is nothing there that, again, can't be changed. How Ansible runs, how it looks, how it interfaces, what it does, these are all things that are changeable within Ansible. We try and add sane defaults, that makes sense. But these are all things that can be changed. I would be remiss if I didn't touch on one last fact on the slide before I move on, that is the Ansible community. It's probably the single greatest asset that Ansible has. Our community is large, <laughs> it's vibrant, it's opinionated, and these are all good things. Um, you know, there's been more than one good kerfuffle in our IRC rooms. Um, but you know, I look at that and I say that that's, you know, that's a positive thing because people are so passionate in the Ansible community about what Ansible is doing. You know, this isn't about a bunch of engineers who are huddled in a corner and writing code and, and producing it and everyone takes it and tries to, to do something with it. It's really all about how we come together as a community. And Ansible has been very careful to not lose that focus as we went through the acquisition of Red Hat and we become part of a bigger company and the platform grows. It's still the main emphasis is on our community, and that's where all the innovation from Ansible comes from. I do love that innovate, that enthusiasm that people bring, but it's also very alienating for normals. Mm -hmm. So normal people who have a normal perspective on life find that uh, over enthusiasm, that exuberance, that passion, to be just plain rude and offensive most of the time. So I find participating in the Ansible rooms. Mm -hmm. un unworkable, or untenable. Mm -hmm. It's impolite. It's rude. It's not pleasant. That's a, that's a great point. Um, I won't go there. I, I, I think that's a, we need, that's to, we need to have people grow up. Yes. So I'm sort of disappointed to hear you say that you find it good, mm -hmm. is what I'm trying to say. I actually regard it as childish, mm -hmm. puerile, and a, an era that we don't live in anymore. I think it's a fair point. I think that, that you know, and, and it's funny, I was just having this conversation with someone yesterday, and you know, I think part, partially part of the problem, and, and, and First and foremost, there's, there's never an excuse for ever any kind of rude behavior in any mm. chat room, no matter what the project is. Yep. Right? Unfortunately, it is part of the world we live in, but I agree. There's never a place for that. Um, and, and certainly, we hold our team up to very high standards. Um, and, and I certainly would hope that you've never heard any of that kind of behavior from our no. team. No. And if we do, I want to talk to you after, off camera. <laughs> um, that being said, um, you know, I think that you know, one of the things I, I was just having, like I said, I was just having this discussion yesterday with someone that, you know, one of the things that we forget from an engineering perspective is that for so many of us who have been part of the Ansible world 24-7 for mm. the last five years, we take a lot of things for granted sometimes. Yes. And, and I think that this hits kind of to your point here that when someone comes in and they're just simply trying to get part of the community and maybe they're asking things yep. that, that were debated a year ago, 
probably the responses aren't what they should be yeah. in terms of be welcoming those people. And that is great feedback. Yeah. And I'm absolutely going to take that feedback back and talk to our community folks about that. So thank you for that. We need to yeah, mitigate over-enthusiasm. <laughs> that's an absolutely fair statement. Absolutely fair statement. Does the community help maintain the documentation repositories? Because the one thing I found is the docs are superb, mm -hmm. right? Um, I'm sure the, there are contributors in the community, but how much of that is actually Ansible staff versus uh, community? Um, so from an engineering perspective, we have two doc writers on staff um, that spend a majority of their time really, what they do is they really more cultivate. They don't actually write a whole lot of documentation. Most of the documentation is actually written by the engineering team themselves. But a fair bit of it comes from the community. In fact, we can go out to the doc site, and I'll actually point out to you, um, you know, where, where, where it's coming from the community and where it's coming from engineering. Um, a good example of this is the Cisco ACI documentation. That's all written by the ACI community team. In fact, Red Hat's never written a line of, of ACI code for Ansible. That all came from, from actually Cisco. Um, so, so that's part of it. Um, part of it is the investment that Ansible made to make sure that documentation was included in the source code and that that's where we extract it from. So that we didn't have a separate documentation area that somehow gets disjointed from the code itself. Um, one of the things we've done in the last couple of years is we put a renewed emphasis though on looking at as code comes in, especially modules, plugins, et cetera, does it have good documentation aligned with it? Um, we've got one, one fella, um, if you're ever in the Ansible community, he goes by the, the name Gundalo. Um, and uh, he has been just a godsend from a documentation standpoint. Um, he spends an awful lot of time working with, with new developers in our community and helping them to write better documentation. Um, that, that guy, I don't know how he ever sleeps. He spends an awful lot of time reading and, and saying, hey, you know, instead of that, that four line description of your argument, how about you flush it out into two or three good sentences? And so those are some of the things that we've done and we've tried to, to really focus on delivering good documentation. Um, in fact, there was a tweet just a couple of weeks ago. I don't know if anyone caught it. There was a, a tweet a couple of weeks ago by Kelsey Hightower, and he talked about documentation and open source projects and, and how many open source projects have failed just simply because not only do they not have good documentation, they just don't have documentation. Um, so it is an area that we do think about and an area we focus on, but it is a joint effort between the community and engineering. Are we going to talk about the proper way to document modules in today? Sure, if you want to. Sure, man. <laughs> <laughs> I'm more than happy to talk about that. You know, it's, uh, when, when, I first, when we first started to build out the network team, this was something It took me a while to instill this into the networking, the, the networking engineers, or the software engineers writing the networking stuff, is, is they would come to me with PRs, and, and this is what I would get, right? Um, you know, a VLAN module. Here's an argument, VLAN ID. The VLAN ID. I'm like, that means nothing to nobody. <laughs> I mean, I could have figured that out. So, so just really working with them to say, okay, we need to provide information that makes sense and, and whatnot. And, and again, it goes back to my previous point of, you work with something long enough, you take for granted that you just know it, right? And other people don't. 